what gives you the power to judge for another woman? And that's, that's something that until today I cannot understand and that I do not have a lot of respect for, to be honest. So good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Freedom Lecture. Also, welcome to all the people that are watching us online. And a very uh, warm welcome to our guest of honor, Justina Verjenska. <laughs> a little bit of an introduction. Um, she co-founded Women on the Net and the Abortion Dream Team, if I'm correct. And it's an activist collective campaigning against the stigma on abortion and also offering advice on, acce uh, on accession to safe abortion in Poland, um, the country that after Malta has the most restrictive laws in Europe when it comes to uh, abortion rights. Um, as I think you've all read, but she has been sentenced to eight months of community service for assisting a woman in, by giving her an abortion pill. We have small talk, and then I will invite Samira Rafaela to the stage. She's a member of the European Parliament and also part of the Commission on Women's Rights and uh, Gender Equality. Uh, and I will invite Liliane Plume. She is a senior advisor to the Dutch Clara Wigman Foundation, a Dutch NGO, and she's a former member of the Dutch Parliament. And we will discuss the increasing power of the uh, pro-life uh, lobby uh, on the political, uh, on, on European politics, on national politics. Um, we will discuss the role, but also the capability of the European Union in safeguarding women's rights. And uh, last, how Dutch NGOs, and maybe more specific, how even Dutch doctors can help uh, or be more of help to uh, Polish women. But first, give a big round of applause for Justina Verjenska. What was the impact of the trial? Because I heard you say something like the silver lining was that more people heard of us. Did this also lead uh, that you were, you know, that you had even received more uh, uh, questions for for help by Polish women, or what? What were all the side effects of the trial? <laughs> Uh, first of all, that was a very good sign effect uh, because uh, we know that after every trial that we receive more calls. Also, on the help, on the um, helpline of uh, women help women, they receive also more emails. Uh, the number of abortion without borders were like screamed every time on the protest in front of the court. Really, people got this message that we are for them even if they cannot pay for abortions, even they, if they cannot like, uh, have abortion at home, they can contact us, they can uh, ask us direct questions how we can help them. And it was the goal, one of the goals for us, to increase knowledge about activists, abortion activists in Poland, to increase the knowledge that abortion without borders can pay for abortions for those who cannot afford the cost. Uh, and uh, I think we... we one in this part of the game. Did you, because I think we all remember the huge uh, demonstrations in Poland when the, the, those more restrictive laws were, uh, did you also receive support um, during your trials from more the progressive uh, population of Poland? Yes, uh, there was a huge support among the Polish society. Amnesty International Polish uh, part uh, did uh, research. They, they made the polls and uh, among young people, those around 25 uh, years old, it was 54% uh, of those uh, said that they would do the same. And uh, 48 uh, above this age said they, they would do the same. So uh, I think we got really a huge support. I mean, we, because I, I think this is not only my case. This is the case of all the abortion activists in Poland. Uh, because it could happen to anyone. It just happened to me. Uh, 
And uh, I think this is the big step, really big step. And also uh, because of the protest of uh, changing the law by the Constitutional Tribunal and uh, many things which happened through the last years, uh, the Belush society, there are polls which uh, shows that more than 70% of the society really accept the situation of uh, abortion on demand up to 12 weeks. So the change has happened. Yeah, because next month, if I'm correct, there are also elections. Does abortion rights play any role in these elections or are they a, a, a marginal subject? Uh, yes, election will happen in 15th of the October and abortion is one of the biggest subjects in this election. There is a lot of campaigns to uh, engage young people because of abortion rights. Uh, the, there is a lot of discussion and one of the subjects among all the debates are abortion rights. I will invite now, because I think we have to talk about Europe, right, and about the Netherlands. So I want to invite Samira Rafaela and Liliane Plume. Please. <laughs> Welcome. How did we end up here in Europe? Well, I think, uh, of course, one uh, very important uh, element is uh, the electoral uh, success of right-wing conservative parties, supported by uh, funding from the United States, from Russia, from Spain, uh, teaming up with, uh, well, the usual suspects being, you know, the Catholic Church, for example. Uh, so I think that's really one factor. And the other factor, I mean, I'm going to say it, but I'm, which is not to say that I totally agree, because many people also say that we've been, that we became too complacent uh, and that we were not il alert enough, uh, we as activists. Um, and I disagree with that because we've been working uh, with many people uh, to try and make our own laws more progressive in order also to uh, be and, and, and stay a safe haven for the ones who do not live in countries uh, where abortion uh, is possible. Uh, but we've also in the Netherlands, there has been a lot of pushback. I mean, we've made uh, good strides in the past uh, years. Uh, for the first time in 40 years, our laws were modernized. Uh, at, uh, we had to, there was like a, um, a waiting period of five days if you want an abortion. Uh, it took us 40 years to get rid of it. So, I mean, it was all hard work. So it's, it's like, it's not that easy uh, to, uh, to make progress, actually. And so um, uh, I do think that you know, everyone is awake now, uh, and also in our country and other countries. I'm sure that Samira will talk to that. Also in, in, in the European Union, uh, abortion, human rights, um, uh, self-determination, it's again on the political agenda, which is also good news for us. Just for us to be clear, does the EU have any binding laws when it comes to safeguarding the rights to abortion? Oh. This is exactly what uh, a lot of members of European Parliament are working on right now. I mean, I, um, I am the SRHR coordinator for my group, Renew Europe, the Liberals in European Parliament. Um, and of course, we have very serious reasons to think about a uniform E uniforming EU law when it comes to uh, legal and safe abortion because we see that the member states are basically implementing different laws, different kind of laws. I mean, if you can imagine, 31 European countries do not have the access to abortion uh, financially covered as part of the health package. And then tw in 26 European countries, it is allowed for health workers to say no, I am not going to conduct it. So the conscious clause. And then, for example, in Italy, um, you know, 70% of the health workers refuse. Um, and even in the more conservative areas in Europe, it's up to 87% yeah. of health workers <laughs> refusing it. So this is why, uh, within my liberal group, indeed, we came up with the idea, with the serious idea, that we need to um, we need to have the right to to legal safe abortion in our EU treaties and charter, yeah. because obviously, you know, the member states and European countries in general have so many policy space 
and actually lawmaking space to not respect the self-determination and bodily autonomy and of can women. You, can you explain to us, because I read that uh, in 2022, the European Parliament voted for a resolution on the entry of yes. abortion rights yeah. into the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU. Exactly. But it remained without effect. Oh, it was only 2022, so <laughs> yes. I mean, when, when we speak about reforming our treaties, then yeah. that is something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> sorry, I mean, it, it's, it's a very long, uh, a long distance uh, strategy. So it's only, you know, an ID that um, is basically being put on the agenda since I would say one year or so very seriously because reforming treaties does not happen every single day. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we are building upon the work of, for example, Lilian Pluma, our former minister, um, that you know decided this very beautiful um, and, and necessary initiative she decides. So I mean, we're still building upon um, uh, initiatives that took place only years ago, and we're trying to make you know the next steps in it. Yeah. But we 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 experience a lot of resistance in society yeah, at this moment. When, when you were telling in, you know in how many countries you know mm -hmm. abortion laws are still you know in so many ways not protected. Uh, if I'm not correct, but the European Parliament is a, I'm still looking for this word, afspiegeling, um, reflection? is a reflection of the politics of all those different ha, national mm -hmm. countries. So then I'm thinking like, how can you ever get this through the European Parliament if there's, you know, so many backlash? Well, at least you have the European Parliament now, but also within the European Parliament, we face a lot of conservative and ultra-conservative powers against us, working against us. And in general, I mean, what is happening now also is that these anti-gender, I call them the anti-rights movements, are organizing very well. I mean, this is also what, you know, she decides uh, the initiative also um, uh, found it out that this is a transatlantic strategy, uh, very well coordinated, very well financed, financed, and these anti-gender movements, they they integrate into lawmaking, into policy making. They enter our institutions, our democratic institutions. So it's not even only the politicians or the polit political dynamics that we're dealing with. We're also dealing with these very well organized anti-gender, anti-rights um, lobby groups that I think should not be allowed within our democratic institutions. But when I say something like that, then for the whole weekend, Geert Wilders and you know journalists are are uh, are pissed off with me. Um, and, uh, and and then do you say we don't want that kind of lobbyist, or do yeah. you think that because I think you could say that Clara Wigman Foundation mm. can also be seen as a lobbyist group on the other side? Oh, I, mean, I can imagine. Yeah, well, um, yeah, so yeah, but we are there for <laughs> universal human rights, and those groups are not. Yes. That's like the basic difference, exactly. I would say. I mean, we can have a very complex yeah. debate on, but that's like how yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. No, and uh, Justina, I was wondering, do you think that Poland will ever be open to treaty changes? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we will have election very soon, and uh, yes, we will see like after 15 of October what will change and how it change. Like in, in the Netherlands, it's always difficult to make people very enthusiastic to vote for the European uh, elections. Uh, they don't really see the importance of it. How is this in Poland? I think same. Uh, people don't know, don't, maybe, maybe don't like, realize how important it is to vote for the European MPs. Uh, but we have some good representatives uh, in in European Parliament. From, po from Poland, from, from yes. From Poland, from, yes, there are Rosa few. Rosa Thun, mm -hmm. for example, yeah. Do you work together? Like, do you, is it a, a big international coalition you're working with? Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, we have we have also the very progressive MEPs, for example, from Poland. And if you talk to them, you hear, you know, a lot about these very terrible stories that that the experiences that they have, of course, for speaking out uh, in Poland in their own country. So, what is of course very necessary is that we need to make sure that people participate in elections, uh, Europe, Europe broadly, um, because when it comes to the rule of law. Um, we have we have still a lot of issues going on, yeah. Uh, could you the same year, November 22, mm -hmm. I mean, check all the party programs, because 
I think we, this is the time to make a strong push to do what Justina asks from us, uh, to decriminalize abortion in the Netherlands, because also in the Netherlands, abortion is still in the criminal code. Uh, with very detrimental impact on women. I mean, it kind of sustains uh, the taboo and the stigma. Why um, is that? Why, why what, what, kind, what kind court? of political power has ensured that it's still in the criminal? Uh... Well, I, uh, it's been there forever. Uh, and I think um, in the past 10 years, um, everyone has taken a step-by-step -step approach uh, mm. to make also our, our, uh, our own policies more progressive. I think that's one reason. The second is that uh, for a long time we thought if in practice every person who needs an abortion can get an abortion safely, legally, affordable, uh, then maybe this is not like the priority. Mm -hmm. However, with everything that's going on in the world and, and the pushback and the backlash, I do think uh, that also in the Netherlands this would be a very important yeah. step. And um, so there has been a citizens initiative signed by I think 90,000 people, probably you all <laughs> signed, uh, except from the person from the conservative side who is here to see what we're talking mm -hmm. about. Um, and so, which means that it had to be debated in parliament, mm -hmm. um, and it was. Uh, and so we we hope, uh, and this is really a call, um, uh, party political call also, that one of the largest parties in the Netherlands at this time, the largest, the VVD, uh, will also uh, support our initiative uh, to do that. And again, I mean, if you vote and you, you care about this, mm -hmm. and you should care about this because it's about all of us and many issues, then please, you know, uh, vote well mm. on uh, November 22. I mean, that's what we need to do, no? Yes, and we need kind of example country who mm. decriminalize abortion as a first country, then I think, and I have this hope, that there will be more, more is, European countries. Is, uh, is abortion, is there not one European country that has decriminalized abortion? Yeah, if it's Sweden. Has, Sweden, yeah. yeah. And Northern, yeah. yeah, Ireland is a good. And, and very yeah. recently, Mexico decriminalized. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. many countries in the world. Mm -hmm. It's like there's a Mexican over there. Yeah, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> um, I, yeah, because also, I mean, uh, of course, listening to Justina talking about the situation in Poland and in many other countries, you do th sometimes think, you know, it's not going anywhere, mm -hmm. but. <laughs> If you look at the world map, then in the past two to three years, big strides have been made. I mean, the US is basically an exception, uh, a country that is, that is facing a backlash. In many, many countries all around the globe, on all continents, abortion is decriminalized, becoming uh, more accessible to more women, more affordable, more legal, if you want to use that term. So there's many, many very positive developments that we can draw energy and inspiration from. I was uh, thinking, Justina, because um, if I understood correctly or not, do you also receive uh, funding from outside Poland for... Uh we received twice. Uh, it was uh, twice from the Belgian government yeah. and once from the French government, but the also financial from, support. Also from foreign NGOs? Sometimes they, they support abortion without borders also with some grant. And also for me to clarify, because um, it is officially criminal for a Dutch organization right now to send abortion pills to Poland, if I understood correctly. Yeah. Yeah, because, well, the, um, the Genese middle of it, uh, the law on, um, medicine. on medicine, yeah, it, it, it says up till now yeah. uh, that um, uh, a doctor needs to be able to see a patient uh, to describe whatever medicine, so that's a generic rule. However, that will be changed, and so that might also um, be helpful. Uh, for uh, in this case, yeah, uh, our minister has, uh, or the minister of health, uh, our minister of health has uh, presented this um, this idea, and they're working. I, I think they're working on the technical details yes. now. So yeah, but, but it it's is generic. It's for yeah. all medicine. So all, yeah. yeah, but it's happening already. But it just was never uh, had. 
it was never there was never a, a, a sentencing or a conviction. Well, I, I I think the organizations like Women on Web and Women Help Women they abide. Uh, to the law, and they have other ways of um, making sure that they can do their work. Uh, they're not breaking the law. I think it's quite important to say that. Yeah, yeah. I was still thinking about this European Parliament and uh, the power mm. it has and the power it hasn't, because of course, um, the anti-European political parties everywhere in Europe are always saying we do not want European interference into our national uh, um, laws and, and ethics and morals and. But since m many more countries are becoming uh, right-wing conservative, this also, of course, changed the European Parliament. And shouldn't we also be a little bit careful that in the end, that will not influence our national progressive mm. politics? Do you see that danger or not? Mm. Yeah, but I'm already dealing with that danger. I mean, it's exactly what's happening right now. It's exactly why we're having these debates in European Parliament, where, for example, uh, Sometimes, you know, anti-LGBTI rights and uh, trans rights um, um, is is being is being spread in terms of communication and language. It's the reason why I and two other uh, MEPs um, went to President Metzola to demand stronger rules against hate speech internally during our debates because it's not going in the right direction at mm -hmm. this moment. And what we see indeed in the council is that we are dealing with member states that have these very conservative and ultra-conservative uh, governments uh, that easily just veto uh, whenever whenever they want or whenever you know we speak about these kind of topics when it comes to bodily autonomy or self-determination. And we do have some, some interesting um, in instruments, I think, that at the moment are helpful. I mean, for example, we have this rule of law mechanism integrated in... Uh, um, in, in the EU budget, uh, so that, for example, we can uh, take away funding or subsidies from the Polish government or the Hungarian government uh, when they breach um, the rule of law. I mean, it did happen already. It did happen already in the case of the LGBTI um, uh, free zones. Just terrible. So, um, but we need to go further. I mean, we also need to be more bold, I think, and especially the council needs to be more bold by taking away, for example, the veto right of, of Poland in this case, or the voting right in general in this case. And what we see in practice is that the European Commission is, you know, often sticking with a warning and then to say, yeah, we might, you know, st start this, um, start this, this, uh, this this procedure against you, but it should not remain with a warning. I mean, I would love to see more court cases also um, against Poland and Hungary, for example. But I really think that we are, we're having this momentum right now in the parliament, um, but also um, I would say partly in the council that um, that that we want to reform decision making, that we want to be more bold uh, when it comes to the, the, the sanction uh, mechanism that we can, um, that we can uh, use. And it's very important also for the European Commission, I know that they are very aware of that, to keep funding and supporting also the civil society in, for example, um, Poland. And at the same time, I'm like, yes, so that means that you need to make sure that you defund the organizations that are going against you know the rights that we're trying to protect and we also in terms of foreign interference I asked for an investigation we're still waiting sort of for the outcomes of that uh, but when it comes to foreign interference we see a lot of foreign interference from Russia for example um, but also from the US and these you know these oligarchs for example um, that that are funding these kind of organizations yeah and that needs to stop yeah you said a few times in your lecture, I'm very practical. Um, when it comes to practicality, then is it for you, do you really um, focus your attention on, you know, on countries, on states to help you, or do you also really need uh, the European Union in order to help you? 
For us right now, it's that we ask specific countries because we know that some laws or we have uh, led us to, to, to help other people or we have uh, groups or um, uh, networks inside those countries uh, which we can be easily in contact with uh, to organize trips for people or be in contact with uh, hospitals. Uh, but of course, we uh, on the ground like, of European Union, especially for, uh, we would need kind of support uh, to open hospitals, for, especially for those who are in the second, third trimester with uh, fetal abnormalities and cannot get abortions, for example, in uh, clinics because there are some obstacles mm -hmm. and medical reasons why uh, they cannot use those, those procedures. And uh, we, especially in European uh, Union, we, we can use this uh, European insurance uh, to not pay for the abortions because it really costs a lot. Even uh, if we have those in clinics or in the hospitals, 1,000 for the procedure is a lot, not only for the Polish people. Uh, so on the like, European level, I think that, that it would be like very good for the network for abortion by borders if you could use each European hospital to get ab abortions, legal abortions in the hospitals, especially in the third trimester with the fetal abnormalities. You also have a lot of women who are on the pro-life side. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious also as a, as a feminist, how do you deal you know, with other women that have such strong opposing beliefs when it comes to a women's body? We never discussed uh, like about somebody's beliefs uh, as an activist, as a person who is helping abortion. But we know that uh, those people who have these hard beliefs, they also sometimes need abortion. And then uh, we don't say no. <laughs> we just say, okay, we are for you, like for anyone else. I mean, I, I deal a lot with, with these women. <laughs> Uh, also on, on social media, for example, there is a very, you know, well-organized group on social media um, that uh, that are basically saying to other women, like women like us, that we are threatening women's rights. We do not respect women's rights because, for example, we, uh, we are in favor, we protect trans uh, rights, for example. Um, and and indeed also the group of women that, that are against uh, legal and, and safe abortion. And to me, that's that's very difficult to have, an, have a debate with, of course. I mean, I cannot imagine that as being a woman yourself, you cannot, you know, you, you do not have the imagination. I mean, we all know how it feels to have uh, this this body. So, so why can you not have this imagination um, if someone else wants it? I mean, it's your belief, these are your values, but what gives you the power to judge for another woman? And that's, that's something that until today I cannot understand and that I do not have a lot of respect for, to be honest, because um, it, it really, it, you bring other women um, into danger. And it's very dangerous how, how many other women are acting based on their own beliefs and do not help other women in these kind of situations. Um, and I think, you know, I always say if, if all women would have had the same opinion in this and at least they would not work against it, then we would have been, then we would have made so much more progress, you know? Um, and that's a that's a really serious issue that we're dealing with. Are there questions? As far as I know, in 1956, the Polish Civil Codex was changed and stated that no woman will be prosecuted for abortion. So I was just wondering how is it possible that the Polish government actually goes against these changes? Also, the Polish constitution clearly states that every Polish citizen has right given by law and God to govern their own body. So again, the Polish government, which is quite conservative wing right now, is going against those laws. In Poland, actually, every person who have abortion, have had abortion uh, by, its, by herself or himself, is not criminalized. Uh, so if I 
will go to any doctor or will go to any person and say that I, I have had my own abortion by myself, I will not be punished in any way. I will be not uh, criminalized. But uh, the helping is a crime in Poland. In uh, laws from 93, uh, and also the penal code from 97, the, there is uh, those laws criminalize people who are actually helping. But this law is, is very old. Uh, this is from the time when nobody knew that there they, they've been some kind of pills for us. Uh, so this is the laws which punished doctors who've been doing the abortions in their like, private practice. And there, there were laws for leave women completely alone, like uh, to afraid to ask anyone for help. Uh, we as activists, uh, and me pers especially me personally, I don't agree with the explanation of the law because giving a pill to a person, it's not like a helping actually. I'm not deciding if she's uh, having the abortion or not. So um, the explanation of this law is like, Tricky. Thank you, Lilian Plume. Thank you, Samir Rafael. And a big applause also for Justina Verjenska. Thank you.